I invite you to take a Bible and turn with me to the book of Ruth. If you're using one of the church Bibles, uh, they're in the rack in front of you. That's page 210. The book of Ruth, page 210. The book of Ruth is this wonderful little book in the Old Testament, just four chapters long. And it's an amazing story. It's a story of the love that a man named Boaz has for a woman named Ruth. It's the story of a love that this same woman Ruth has for her mother-in-law Naomi and the love that her mother-in-law Naomi has for her. And most of all, it's a beautiful story of the love that God has for Naomi, for Ruth, for Boaz, for all the children of Israel, and for you and I today. And it's a story of this loving father who cannot sit idly by while our lives fall apart because of sin, Satan, death, and suffering, and does everything in his power and pays any price including the ultimate price of giving his own son, Jesus Christ, so that he might be free to bless us. That's the story of Ruth. Well, today we're looking at this book of the Bible and this story from the perspective of Naomi, the mother-in-law. In the next few weeks, we're going to look at Boaz and we're going to look at Ruth, but this morning it's Naomi. And my invitation to you is, is as you listen to the story of Naomi, that you would look for ways that your story might resonate with hers, both the highs and the lows, so that the journey that she went on, which the Lord has recorded for us, might be an encouragement to us in our journey. We begin Naomi's story by thinking about her circumstances at the beginning of the book of Ruth. So look in chapter one, verse one, and let's understand where Naomi is at in life when the book opens. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judea, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. That's the woman that we're talking about this morning. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. They went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilian also died, And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Now the opening verse tells us there was a famine in the land of Israel. And this couple, Elimelech and Naomi, moved to Moab. Now the way that the verse is structured does not make us think that Naomi had any choice in this whatsoever. This seemed to be her husband's decision. And so she simply has to go along, move into a foreign country. And so she's living in Moab, which is modern-day Jordan, not in her homeland. While she's there, tragedy strikes, and her husband dies. She has two children, two boys, from that husband that she is raising. They live in Moab, modern-day Jordan, And we're told that these two boys grow up and marry not Jews, but Moabite women, which is against the Mosaic law. And today, a modern analogy might be an Orthodox Jewish mom having her two Orthodox Jewish sons marry Arab women. And so Naomi is now the mother-in-law not to Jewish daughters-in-law, but to Arab daughters-in-law, that too a difficult situation. We're told that they are there for 10 years. 
We think 10 years after the boys get married, which means there are no grandchildren for 10 years, meaning both couples are barren. Also, very difficult for Naomi, especially in that context and that culture, where children and grandchildren are such an integral part of the family structure and what a woman like Naomi would see as her value in life. And then, worst of all, her two sons die. Now I say worst of all because in verse 5, in Hebrew, the word that's there for sons, both Malon and Killian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons, is not the normal word that's used for adult married men. It's the word that's normally used for babies. And what the author seems to be saying is, is that Naomi's lost her two baby boys. That even though they're grown up and even though they're married, that the anguish that she's feeling in her heart is that she's lost her babies. And the picture of Naomi at the beginning of the book of Ruth is one of intense suffering. Probably the only person in the Old Testament she can be compared to is Job. She's lost her husband. She's lost her baby boys. She's living in a foreign land. She's got two foreign daughters-in-law. She's got no grandchildren. Everything in life is difficult and hard. Perhaps you might be able to resonate with some of those circumstances. Maybe you're a widow. Maybe you're living in a foreign country. Maybe you want kids and aren't able to have them. Maybe you want grandkids and can't have them. Maybe one of your children or multiple children have married people that you wouldn't have wished for them to marry. Maybe you've lost a child. Naomi, Naomi has all these things going on. And we listen to her life and it's full of pain and death and sorrow and sadness. And that's Naomi's circumstances at the beginning of the story. Now, we don't know why these things have happened. Some might assume, well, maybe she's being punished for her sins. She didn't choose to move to Moab. She didn't choose these wives for her sons. There is nothing in the story that gives us any indication that she's being punished for her sins. She might be, but that doesn't seem to be what's going on here. Rather, we're just, we're not even supposed to be asking the question, why is life so difficult for her? We're just supposed to simply realize this woman has an incredibly hard load that's been placed upon her. The journey is dark. It's horribly difficult. And that's her circumstances at the beginning of the story of Ruth. Now we need to move on, not only her circumstances, we need to see her response to these circumstances. Verse number 11. Meanwhile, as you're looking at verse 11, the famine has stopped in Israel and Naomi's like, I got nothing here in Moab. My husband is dead. My sons are dead. My life is essentially dead. I may as well go back to Bethlehem where I'm from and die there. So she's getting ready to head back, and her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, are going to go with her. Verse 11, but Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me. Stop there for a moment. How do we describe Naomi's situation? Hopeless. From her point of view, there's nothing that can fix this situation. Her baby boys are gone. She's too old to get married again and have more children. There is no hope in this situation. Everything is against her. Keep going. Even if 
I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons. Would you remain until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Jump down to verse 20. She does end up going back to Bethlehem, back to Bethlehem. When she arrives, the people that she knew years and years ago look at her and say, can this possibly be Naomi? And here's her response, verse 20. Don't call me Naomi. Naomi in Hebrew means pleasant. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara. Mara means bitter. Because the Lord Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Lord Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. And here there's a bit of a warning that's starting to go off. Naomi's circumstances are absolutely horrendous. But somewhere along the way, she has begun to decide that the Lord has abandoned her. You see, Naomi has rightly realized if God had wanted, he could have stopped us from moving to Moab. She understands God has the power. He could have kept my husband from dying. She knows God has the ability. He could have stopped my sons from marrying foreign women. And she realizes God could have kept her two baby boys from dying, and he didn't. That is actually true. But the danger is that she has concluded from that that God doesn't care. She's concluded that God has turned against her, that God no longer has any kindness for her, that God is fighting against her. She says, I went away full and he stole it all from me. He robbed me. He brought me back here with nothing. He is fighting against me and she's accusing God of being her enemy. Please, there's nothing wrong with the sadness and the mourning and the difficulty of coming face to face with death, of seeing sin, of suffering. That's not the problem. It's not even a problem to acknowledge that God has allowed those things. The warning sign that's going off here, and it's very, very subtle, is that in the midst of all this suffering, she's concluded that God no longer loves her. That's the problem. Amen. And there's a word for that. It's the word bitterness. Maybe you're not able to relate to Naomi and her circumstances, but maybe you know this feeling of thinking that God has turned his back on you. Maybe you've been looking for a job for a long time and haven't been able to find one. Maybe there's a health situation that you've been going through and it feels like there's no hope in it. Maybe there is a child that's walked away from the Lord or spiritual warfare that you've been going through or some mental illness that you've been dealing with yourself or in a loved one. And in the midst of that suffering and darkness and hardship, you've begun to think, God doesn't care about me anymore. God's turned his back on me. God is against me. God doesn't love me. Maybe you've looked around at other people and you've said, why do they have it so much easier than I do? And you have wrongly concluded it's because God loves them more than he loves me. And there's a word for that, and it's bitterness. That's why she wants to be called Mara. It's not just, and it's so subtle. Please hear me. Her circumstances are bitter. 
But when she subtly slides into feeling that in the midst of her bitter circumstances, God has abandoned her, that's when it becomes bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15 says this. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. This is actually a quote from Deuteronomy 29, a passage that Naomi should know well. The imagery here, and the reason I gave you the Hebrews version of the quote instead of the Deuteronomy version of the quote, is because here the imagery is just a little bit clearer. And the imagery is that of a garden. How many of you out in gardening have ever taken a shovel full of dirt, turned it over, and saw that underneath was not just dirt, but a bunch of roots just hidden there under the dirt. There may not have been anything necessarily on the surface, but underneath the dirt is shot full of just roots, roots of all sorts of things. I always wonder, what is all this stuff? How did this all get here? That's the imagery in Hebrews 12, and the idea is, is our lives have within them the roots of bitterness. It's just a fundamental part of who we are. It's part of our flesh. It's part of what it means to be human. You don't have to do anything to have the roots of bitterness present in your life. They're already there. The point is, is that those roots, you don't have to do something to cause weeds to grow from those. It's just what happens in life. And what God is saying here is, be careful. Because those roots are easily activated. And just like you can come out one morning and look in your garden and think, where did all these weeds come from? Have you ever had that feeling like they grew overnight? I sometimes think if you just sat there and watched them, you could actually see them grow. Like there was nothing here and now they're here. That's the imagery this is drawing on. You and I don't have to do something to cause bitterness to grow. The roots of it are already there. They're part of our life. And when we go through the anguish of suffering, it can activate those roots. When we begin to crave a life different than the one God's given us, it can activate those roots. When we look around at other people and think, why aren't they going through things like I'm going through things? Or why does their life seem to work out so great and my life is so difficult? It activates those roots. And the point of Hebrews is, is realize that this happens. Understand that you and I have inherent within us all the things we need for bitterness to grow. You don't have to do anything. It's just there. Well, what happens when it grows? Well, it does what weeds do. It begins to choke out the life of the fruitful stuff that's supposed to be in the garden. The weeds take the place of what the garden was intended to do. It makes it difficult to see what is actually supposed to be growing. Have you ever seen an overgrown garden that has weeds everywhere? It's hard to tell what's actually being grown in this place. What's actually supposed to be happening here? And that it's so subtle. But slowly those weeds grow up and they begin to choke the life out of the plants that are in the garden. Let's see how that happens to Naomi in our story. Verse number 15, still in chapter 1. Verse number 15, Naomi is getting ready to go back to Bethlehem, and she says to Ruth and to Orpah, look, stay here. I don't want you to come with me. Orpah agrees to stay. Ruth says, no, I want to go with you. Verse 15, look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. Now, Why does Naomi want to send Ruth home? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, if Ruth comes with her, Naomi's responsible for her. Naomi's old enough that she's a widow that when she goes back to Bethlehem, she can live off the system. There are systems in place to take care of her as a widow. 
Ruth is too young to do that. Ruth will need to find a job, and who will be responsible for having her help, help her find a job? Naomi. If Ruth comes with her, Naomi's going to constantly be reminded of her lost children. She's going to constantly be reminded she's got no grandchildren. She's going back to Bethlehem to leave all of that pain behind. She doesn't want to be reminded of it. If Ruth goes with her, she's going to constantly be reminded. Plus, Ruth's a foreigner. She doesn't know anybody in Bethlehem. She might not be accepted. The Jewish people living in Bethlehem may not be super excited that this Moabite woman is now coming to live with them. And remember, she represents an aspect of disobedience to the Mosaic law in the sense of that they had a Jewish man marrying somebody he wasn't supposed to marry. And Naomi would be constantly reminded of the shame. Perhaps others would be quick to bring it up to her. And so Naomi just wants to leave everything behind. So she actually doesn't want Ruth to go with her. But look at Ruth's response, verse 16. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. How beautiful is that? That is one of the most beautiful commitments from one person to another person. From this daughter-in-law to a mother-in-law, it's in Scripture, it's one of the most beautiful statements of someone saying, look, I'm with you, I'm not leaving you, I'm for you, I'm going to be faithful to you, we're in this together. It's gorgeous. How does Naomi respond? Verse 18. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. What? Wait a minute. Where's the, bless you, my child? Where's the, oh, thank you, that at least I have you that I can go through this with? Where's the, hey, you know what? If two are better than one, we'll do this together. There's none of it. Naomi simply realizes, I'm not going to be able to talk her out of this. What's happened? The bitterness. The weeds are preventing Naomi from seeing that God is giving her Ruth. Why? Naomi doesn't want Ruth. She wants her kids back. She wants her husband back. She wants her life back. She wants grandkids. She doesn't want a daughter-in-law. And so she can't see. She can't see that only the Lord could have caused Ruth to make that statement. Only the Lord could have done that. The bitterness is blinding her. It's choking the life out of her. Now please, a daughter-in-law isn't a replacement for dead sons. A daughter-in-law isn't a replacement for a dead husband. But she can't see that God is still loving her because of the bitterness. Now, although it's understandable, it's still disobedience. God has said, do not allow bitterness to grow up in your heart. And Naomi has allowed it. She's allowed her bitter circumstances to become bitterness. So what is God's response to her sin? And there is no other word for it. What is God's response to the fact that Naomi has allowed the weeds of bitterness to grow up in her life? Well, look over now in chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 20, but let me fill in the story while you're looking at verse 20. What happens is that they do come back to Bethlehem. It's interesting, I read you those verses. Notice, at nowhere does Naomi actually introduce Ruth to anybody. And oh, by the way, this is my daughter-in-law. She's never even mentioned. They've moved back to Bethlehem, and at some point, Naomi realizes, okay, we gotta find Ruth a job. And so she sends her out 
with no instructions about where to go or what to do. She just says, you got to go find a field and you got to go work in the field. So Ruth just simply goes out and chooses a field at random. She doesn't know anybody. She doesn't know what she's doing. She goes to a field and she just happens to come to a field of a man named Boaz. And Boaz is incredibly kind to her, a foreigner, unexpected. He protects her from sexual assault. He makes sure she has good work that she can do. He tells the foreman and the supervisor, look, make sure there's extra pulled out for her, gives her meaningful work that she's engaged in, shares a meal with her, and when she goes home, he gives her an extra portion to be able to take home to her mother-in-law. Ruth comes home after day one. This is just day one on the job. And Naomi's like, how'd it go? Ruth's like, you're never going to believe this. Like, all these things, and she recounts all that what happens. And Naomi says, well, whose field was it? And Ruth says, some guy, his name's Boaz. And then we get verse 20. The Lord bless him. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, he has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. Now, the trick in this verse is that the pronouns in Hebrew are ambiguous. Okay, we know that the first, the Lord, that's Yahweh. Bless him, that's Boaz, because Boaz has been kind. But what's not clear is when it says, he has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. Who does the he refer to? Well, could be Boaz. Boaz, after all, has welcomed this foreigner into his fields. He's protected her. He's been generous to her. He shared his food with her. He's given her more to take home. It could be about Boaz. In fact, my first reading of it was, well, that's what we're talking about. It's not. How do I know that? Well, he has not, what? Stopped showing his kindness. Remember, this is day one that Boaz meets Ruth. This is day one of the kindness. This cannot be a continuation of kindness because it's the first day. Who then is the he referring to? It's the Lord. It's so interesting. In Hebrew, it could refer grammatically to either one. It's very, very subtle. But the realization here is, is Naomi is recanting what she said in chapter one where she accused God of stopping being kind to her and all of a sudden she realizes, look, what are the odds of all the fields in all of Bethlehem that Ruth would at random pick the field of the one guy she needs to end up in? How does that happen? Listen. Naomi knows she's related to Boaz, but she doesn't send Ruth to that field. She just says, go pick one at random. And when Ruth comes back and ends up in Boaz's field, Naomi realizes, wait a second. There's somebody whose hand is at work behind this. There's somebody who's arranged for this to happen. And in this moment in chapter 2, Naomi is realizing, I was wrong. God has not stopped showing his kindness. Again, her dead sons still are not back to life. She's still a widow. She doesn't have any grandchildren. In no way am I saying at this moment in chapter 2, verse 20, that Naomi suddenly thinks, well, life's great now. That's not what's happening, but what she is realizing is that although she still has bitter circumstances, that God has not stopped showing his kindness. She's pulling up the weeds of bitterness. What's the result? What's the result? Well, the result is she can now see more clearly. How did God get her out of the bitterness? Kindness. God's kindness leads to repentance. Please, although it's easy to sympathize with Naomi, and we should, she was sinning. 
She did allow bitterness in her life. But what was God's response? To overcome her bitterness with kindness. What is she now able to do? Well, in chapter 3, the weeds get pulled up. Circumstances haven't changed. But the weeds get pulled up. She can now see things that other people can't see. Specifically in chapter 3, she can see that Ruth should marry Boaz and Boaz should marry Ruth. Neither one of them can see it. Why not? They got their own weeds in their own life from their own things going on. We're going to talk about them in the next couple weeks. Why can Naomi see it? Because the weeds are gone. And she realizes, look, this is not just about God trying to help Ruth get a job. God's up to something bigger here. She can see it because there's no more weeds blinding her. Not only that in chapter 3, turn over to chapter 4. Verse 13. After Naomi helps arrange the marriage, she convinces Ruth to marry Boaz and convinces Boaz to marry Ruth. After they get married, it says that Ruth became his wife When Boaz made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. He May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Now we're talking about the grandchild. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. The grandson doesn't replace the lost children. The grandson doesn't replace the lost husband. The grandson doesn't erase the pain, the difficulty, and the hardship but it is a blessing from God that God has given her someone, just one grandbaby, but that grandbaby is going to go up, grow up, and take care of grandma. So much so that they are actually willing to consider that child Naomi's son as well as Ruth's. And why? Because God gave to Naomi a daughter-in-law who treats her better than seven sons would. Again, God's not saying a daughter-in-law who's better than seven sons. Do you understand the difference? A daughter-in-law who will treat her better than seven sons would. Naomi's now able to join in a chorus of praise. Why? Because the bitterness has been removed and she can see in the midst of suffering, God has not stopped showing his kindness. Kindness. 